everyone, good morning. Beautiful day, and honest to goodness, wonderful food downstairs. Uh, it was put in that it was going to be a catered hot breakfast, and we everybody thought, oh, who's coming? You know, the somebody from uh, outside, but the in, it was an inside job. The people who were that led by Gail and Caleb, you know, Caleb, he just flipped those those uh, pancakes really well, and there was there was lots of food and it was wonderful. So thank you all for anyone that had any part in it, and of course those of us that ate, thank us too because there was not much food left over. Well, in that last song, though the eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. Um, we read something here from a, an author that I like. I, I, I love reading his books, Christian Man. Uh, it's it's uh, Frank Peretti. And he writes, sin is the monster that we love to deny. It can stalk us, bite a slice out of our lives, return again and bite again. And even as we bleed and hobble, we prefer to believe that nothing has happened, that nothing is wrong. There are no monsters, a, a man-eater that blinds and numbs its victims. There is no need to flee. And then it consumes us at its leisure. As we just sang, though the eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. We don't sometimes, though the eye of sinful man, sometimes we don't realize sin is the monster. We have all been assailed by this beast, sometimes face to face. But all too often, from a direction we aren't prepared to defend. And it's only in recognizing the beast for what it is that we can hope to escape it at all. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and empowered to overcome sin. But opening the door and tossing the beast table scraps of our soul, table scraps of our character, we hope to drive it off. But that's not a way to drive off sin, the beast. The sin toys with us, and it's a sure way. If it toys with us long enough, we will lose a part of ourself. The Bible is a story, and we all have a part in it to one degree or another. Years later, it still cries out the same warning that God gave Cain back in Genesis 4, 7. He said to Cain, and he is saying to us, sin is crouching at the door and it wants you, but you have to overcome it. So you wonder, how does this Bible have relevancy today? My gosh, that's Genesis. That's way in the front of the Bible. How does anything that went on there you know, prefer and, and, and use for us today? How, how does that concern us? And, and that's what we're looking for a lot of times. We want to know, how is the Bible relevant to us here and now, face to face? And one of the things that jumps right out at us is there's always going to be sin. The, Satan does not take a day off. He does not take a vacation, no coffee break. He does not sleep. Sin is crouching at our door, and we have to overcome it. If we don't overcome sin, sin will overcome us eventually. So what do we do? How can, we, how can we battle sin? First of all, it's not, uh, you know, spears and swords and guns and all these, you know, glocks and, and all the, the things that we have. Nothing that we have 
and, and can hold in our hand can fight sin. It is a spiritual battle. It is God versus Satan. And here we are, right in the middle. We have to fight sin. We have to, to uh, and I told somebody this, and I meant it. I was, I was kind of counseling someone, and I said, I, I, you know, it's not to swear or it's, it's not anything. But I said, a lot of times we simply need to look at the devil that we have, whatever configuration we have in our minds. We need to look at the devil and say, Satan, go to hell. That's his home. Hell is where he lives. And hell is where he's going to end up sometime. Whenever the final, when you read Revelation, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and then thrown into hell where he will be. And we do not want to be with him. We don't, hell was not created for us. God didn't direct or want any person to go there. It is for Satan and his minions. Uh, but the problem is, along the way, Satan kind of picked up what I guess you could call a posse. And he got people out there wanting to be, wanting to go, wanting to do what Satan has uh, planned for them. And Satan is busy doing some things. He got these minions over here attacking us. Sin is the monster that we love to deny. There's no, there's no sin. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. I've given God the key to my house. God, here you go. Here's the key to my house. You can come in and you can look around. So what would happen sometimes if God says, okay, I got the key. All right, I am going to come down. So God comes down, he opens the door, he walks in, and he said, wow, great house. Starts walking over, and he puts his hand on a doorknob, and the person goes, no, no, wait a minute, no, wait, don't, don't go in there. Don't, don't go in that room. That's kind of off limits to you, God. It's, it's kind of like my room. That's because something in there is offensive to God. We'll give God the key to our house, but maybe we won't give God the key to every room. And what's the point then? If we're not going to give everything over to God, if we're going to hide and harbor some sin and, and kind of deny even that it's there, what's the point? You're going to accept Jesus Christ and you're going to try and do absolutely the best you can to live the kind of life that Jesus Christ wants you to live. And that is trying to refrain from sin, trying to walk away from it, trying to live a humble, loving, and merciful life to those around you. And sin has no place in that. Sin, the monster that we love to deny. Let's look at our scripture here, our, our uh, sermon here this morning. It is the three open prayer. The biggest way that you can fight sin is through prayer. Prayer. Somebody will say, oh boy, we need to really pray hard for this. You pray hard all the time. You might pray more often for something, but when you pray, pray. Don't just mumble the words. Don't just go through. I'll go to a, a, a church and, and they'll say, well, we're going to have the, the pastoral prayer ending with the Lord's Prayer. So you say, Father, how, how is it that you want us to pray? And then everybody starts praying. Our Father who art in heaven, Oh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. Come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. That is, that's terrible to do that. God gave us a wonderful prayer, you know, and we, we should, Almighty Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So I try to inject like little things into that. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we're, we're, you try to make it relevant rather than just going through the words. 
So this is what Colossians, this is what Paul is talking about here. This was written, probably Colossians was written in 60 AD or so, and the whole emphasis of the book of Colossians is simply Christ is supreme. You all love, the Jewish people loved angels. Christ was higher than the angels. Hebrews in the New Testament takes a lot from these books, talking about Christ being divine. And this book really talks a lot about it, this Colossians. A lot of Old Testament things about God and a lot of New Testament things. But uh, Colossians is simply that Christ is supreme. It is located in Asia Minor, the Church of Colossae, and that's modern-day Turkey. Um, Paul was imprisoned in Rome when he wrote this. Uh, and, and this imprisonment, he wrote like four books. He wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. This was when he was under house arrest in Rome from 60, maybe 61 or thereabouts. It's hard to say when he was let go. But Paul was imprisoned in, in Rome. This was the first time he was in prison. The second time they got him under Nero, he was thrown into the maritime dungeon. And that's when he wrote 2 Timothy, the last book that he wrote, Please Come to Me. He knew he was a dying man and he was in a dungeon. It wasn't this here where he was an, under a house arrest. Paul knew. But here he took advantage of being imprisoned and being able to pray, being able to write books, even though he had every reason to yell or, or pout or be put in time out somewhere, Paul still used this time. And he wrote four letters, the prison letters. And we know them all. Ephesians is especially powerful. We are saved by grace. Then he, he writes Colossians, Philemon, and of course, the, the, the book of joy, the Philippians. We're going to look at chapter 4 here. You've heard the scripture being read just a few minutes ago. And it goes like this, starting in chapter 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Do we devote ourselves to prayer? Look at that word, devote. The Hebrew has different you know, every Hebrew word has like five meanings it could be. And devote is steadfast, prayer. And, and then it scales down. It's, it's, you know, kind of, okay, I will, and then duty. We don't want to pray just out of duty because you get the, our Father, who art in heaven. We don't want that. To say the words is nice, it's one thing to do, but to say it with your heart rather than with your mouth, that's what God wants us to do. Devote yourselves to prayer. Do the churches that we have around now devote themselves to prayer? Do they have a prayer time where it's like the church is going to be open and we are going to go there and we're going to meet Anybody that can come is going to come, and we're going to sit here, and we're going to talk for a minute. People are going to have some prayer issues, and then we are going to, to sit silently, and we are going to pray. That, that's a powerful thing, and, and not a lot of churches have a prayer time. You know, you can have it early, like before your service. You can have it on a night that people were, were, could be here like for meetings or something so that you don't have to ask them to come out, oh my gosh, one more night to pray. Prayer in a church is terribly important. You know, there's a lot of sin out there. And the only way that that sin, the only way that angels have power and, and, and they're going to like fight the demons, the only way that they are able to do the job that they do is when we infuse them and empower them with prayer. 
Uh, the, the gentleman that I, I read, Frank Peretti, had a book where the demons were circling the church and the people were meeting in there and they were going to vote on something. They had a big issue that was going to maybe divide the church or, or what. And it said that they looked down, the angels were up and they looked down and they saw the demons just circling the church. And they waited for the people to go into the church and release prayer up to them so that they could go down and battle the demons that were encircling that church and keeping it down. Prayer empowers the angels. Prayer lifts our hearts and our souls up to God, asking Him that we need help. So he asks here, he says, pray. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and being thankful. We should be spiritually alert. That's what watchful is. We need to be looking around and see what is it that's going on? What can I direct my prayer to? Is it somebody, you know, that's let I know, somebody in my church, maybe a member of my family, maybe someone who is in the final stages of their life that God will take them home? You know, where, where can I, I pray? What is it that's out there that I can focus on? What is it that I could be watchful for and pray about? And then he also says, a lot of times, you know, whenever we pray, it's almost like a laundry list. Okay, God, I love you, God, Lord. Okay, I need, and you give him like, it's almost like God's a vending machine. You look at it and you go, hmm, I need strength. How much is it? Two dollars. Okay, two dollars. Bang. Oh, thanks. I got strength now. God's not like that. God's not a vending machine. God, God is not something where we can tell him what we need immediately and then we, we get it. We pray and we know God hears our prayers. Prayers of a, a righteous people availeth much when they pray to God. So, it says, be watchful and be thankful. Lord, thank you, first of all, for what we have. In 1 Thessalonians, it's uh, five, chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. God has a plan for you. Uh, you know, you're sitting there thinking, oh boy, I, I heard someone say this morning, oh, I'm a little bit older, and I don't know, and I'm still living, and I just wonder, God has a plan for you. It doesn't matter if you are young, like David in the Bible. It doesn't matter if you are older, like Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was the only woman that I know of who could qualify for Social Security and the WIC program, because she had Isaac. <laughs> You know, if they had that back then, she would have qualified. Just because you're older doesn't mean God is done with you. You, you, still, have, you still have a mission to accomplish. You know, and, and, and people are like, well, what, what do you mean? It's like God has a, a mission for you. You have to be watchful. You have to be thankful that he does. But you also have to go about and find out what your mission is here on this side of heaven. So, we look at Colossians, we look at the, it says, be spiritually alert and be thankful. And then it gets into, again, notice how prayer is mentioned in here. It says in the verse number three, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message. If we are praying to God and we say, Lord, I want to go, say you have somebody in mind that you would like and you are praying about. They, they are, have not perhaps made the, the step yet. It, it could be a family member or a coworker. It could be somebody at bingo, somebody at, at, at Walmart. But there's somebody out there that you've talked to perhaps are seen or somebody's told you about them, then in the first part of this, it says, be watchful. Lord, 
you know, I'm going to pray that you open their heart. I'm going to be spiritually alert. I'm going to be thankful. And I, I want this person, I, I want to pray for this person. If you're going to talk to some person about God, you first need to talk to God about that person. And, and the first three open prayer here, the first opening is to open their heart. Because if their heart is open and, and, and ready and fertile and wanting to receive God's word, that, that's a major step. Because without that, without a heart that is ready to be, to receive, sometimes your words just don't really mean a lot. They bounce off, as it were. So if you're going to talk to somebody, if you're going to witness to somebody, if you have somebody on your mind, when I go there tonight to the church, I want to see, and boy, I hope uh, Billy is there, or I hope Susie is there. Lord, if they're there, please, Open their heart. That's the first open in this. The second open, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message. Open a door. You've opened their heart. Now, Lord, I'd like you to open a door. I would like to see them. I would like to be in a situation where I come face to face with them, and I'm able to talk to them. Their heart is ready, Lord. All we need now is, you know, part of it too, is to open a door. Maybe I could sit by them. Maybe I could see them standing before everybody leaves, and I can just go up and, and give them a hug and say, I love you, and you know Jesus loves you. And they start crying, and you say, what is it? How can I help you? And you sit down. That's a door that just opened right there. Their heart is, is ready. God provided an open door. So that's two of the three open prayers. Open up their heart and open a door. Open a door for our message. The, our message is the gospel. Our, our message simply is uh, Jesus lived, Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ rose again, and Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, and he is preparing a place in his mansion for those of us that love him. That is, that's our testimony. I mean, we add other things, you know, like, I, you know, I went to this church, and I, but when somebody says, you know, what do you believe in? Jesus lived, died, Jesus arose again, and Jesus is in heaven waiting for me. And he could be in heaven waiting for you too. How is your relationship with Jesus? Sometimes we can do even some, sometimes something like that. Open a door so that, so that we can proclaim our message. And we can proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. The mystery of Christ. Boy, you talk about, it, it is to people. You know, to the, to the non-believer or to the person that is, you know, wanting to find out more about Christianity, it's a mystery. What do you mean a, a woman gave birth to somebody and she was a virgin? I don't, I don't understand that. What do you mean this guy died and then rose up again? And I mean, he just was dead and now he's back. You know, that's a mystery to people that we have to explain. And then we speak a different language sometimes than people. I, I remember working at Waynesburg College up there and we would go and do the chapel and they would bring somebody in and they would come in, it would be like some big speaker from somewhere, you know, and he was all acclaimed and he had all the, all the, you know, alphabets after his name, you know, MBA, DIVN, PhD, you know, it was like this long, you know, and they would pay them. And I think the fee at the time was like 1500 or $1,800. 
they would come in and they would preach or they would meet with the people on Monday night. They had like a, an open door or an, a, you know, a, a place where they would, the students would meet, anybody could come. So this person would go there and, and, and talk to them. And then they would preach at the chapel service on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Technically, the, the, the school was supposed to shut down and everybody was supposed to be there at 11 o'clock. But it's amazing how, you know, uh, 600 or 700 on-campus Christian students can dwindle down to like maybe 150 or so. You know, you're supposed to be there, but, uh, you know, I'm going to go nap. I'm going to go do whatever. Well, they would bring this guy in, or, or even a, they would bring a lady in, and they would start. We're going to talk today about the sanctification and the transubstantiation of God. We're going to go over all the hermeneutics, and we are going to do the exegesis of the gospel. I looked at my daughter once. I, I, was, I, I mean, I knew what those words meant and all, but I looked over to her, and she goes, I don't know what he's saying. I says, you know, they had to prove. I guess because they had all this education and they were getting money, they had to prove that they knew the gospel by using these really big words. The mystery of the gospel. And they didn't do anything to help clean it up. They talked in, in big words. And you could just see the, 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 the kids, most of them, most of the students, and, and they just would check out. They didn't understand what was going on. They, they were in the midst of school and studying. They came there most of the time to get fed, to get lifted up, to hear the choir sing, to maybe somebody telling them, don't give up. God loves you. Keep on fighting. Keep on praying. Well, here we have devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. Open up their heart. Pray for us, too, that God will open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. He's in chains. It didn't matter to Paul. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was stoned. He was run out of town. He was thrown in jail numerous times. But he still proclaimed the mystery of Christ. He was in a house here. It was probably a rented house, and he was under house arrest in Rome, but he was probably chained to a Roman soldier so that he couldn't get away. This, he says, proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So you open their heart by being watchful and thankful. You ask Christ to open a door to give you the, the, the time to give you the, the, the uh, as, as them, maybe as an audience, to give you a forum to talk to somebody. Open that door, Lord. You've opened their hearts and you've opened the door. Those are two of the three. And the final one, the three open prayer. The final one reads, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. That's the third open. Open my mouth is what he's saying. You've opened their heart. You've opened the door. Okay, now, Lord, open my mouth. Allow me to proclaim the mystery. Allow me to, to minister to, to this person. And maybe I'll open my mouth, but if they want to talk, Lord, then, uh, then please allow me to open my ears and hear what they're saying. You know, I, I've, I've sat in things where people have been counseling somebody, and the person that's counseling them doesn't shut up. They just keep talking. They talk about what they went through. They talk about, and this person is sitting there, and I almost want to just like reach over and grab them and say, shut up. Let them talk. Uh, that wouldn't be very nice, though. I mean, you're trying to show that you're nice and meek and humble. And telling somebody to shut up is probably not. But I've seen, let, let people talk sometimes. But when they ask questions, Lord, 
allow me to open my mouth. In Ephesians, Paul even says near the end of the book, he said, Lord, open my mouth and put the words in it that you want me to say. And it's not transubstantiation and sanctification and all those things. When you open your mouth, you proclaim the gospel clearly. That's what he has right here. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And what is proclaiming the gospel clearly? Jesus did it. Jesus, when he talked to shepherds, he talked about sheep. When he talked to fishermen, he talked about fish. When, when he talked to, to uh, moms, he talked about kids. You know, Jesus was able to talk to people and spread the gospel to them in terms that they understood. There wasn't no exegesis and all this stuff. He was able to talk to the people and give them a gospel lesson in the way that in, in their life, the way it mattered, the way it was relevant to them. And that's what we have right now. We need to know how is the Bible relevant to us? My gosh, that, the Bible was written so, so long ago. How is that relevant to me? Well, we just already saw sin is out there crouching at the door. We have to overcome it. We have to spread the gospel. Two times Jesus said, go out the Great Commission and you will be my witnesses, he says in Acts, and you'll go to Jerusalem and Samaria and the ends of the earth. What he's telling us is, go to your Jerusalem. Go to the people that are right around you, your little family, your Jerusalem. Then go to the people that are outlying, maybe family members, maybe church people, maybe co-workers, and try to spread the gospel. And then go to the ends of the earth. And it doesn't mean, you know, people think, oh, I'm, I'm never going to go to Japan or I'm never going to go to Taiwan or any of those places that are the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth is somewhere that makes you uncomfortable to witness, but you know it needs done and you need to do it. And you overcome your fear and you overcome with prayer and you go and do something. It could be ministry in a hospital. It could be ministry in a prison anything like you know you might be able to see where you're ministering that's not the ends of the earth it's right over there but it's the ends of the earth to you because I never thought I would ever do that the ends of the earth is something that people kind of take out of context but what ends of the earth means is I'm going to take my gospel and I'm going to take my Bible and I'm going to take my evangelism and I am going to go there might be a nursing home it could be anywhere. It's somewhere that you think I would never be able to go and spread the gospel. But then all of a sudden, God starts working on you. And you look and you think, you know what? All right, I'm going to pray about this. Next thing you know, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go. You, you, can you come with me? It would be, and they're like, no, I'm not going. All right, then I'll go by myself. And you go up and you knock on the door and you say, can I talk to the chaplain or the volunteer coordinator? And you go in and say, would it be okay if I came in here and, and, and maybe went to some rooms or had a little meeting in the, in the lunchroom about, uh, Christian, about Christian life and, and, and talk to people and maybe we could pray or, or maybe we can sing. And the whole time then you leave and you go, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? That's the ends of the earth over there. But you did it. You did it. You went to the ends of the earth and you made plans to go and minister there. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. And he ascended into heaven. So our scripture today, looking back here and, and closing, the three open prayer. Learn it. Think about it. If, if today's sermon here, if today what we're talking about, hold on to this when you leave. Lord, open their heart. I want to pray for a specific person. Then open a door, Lord, and allow me an opportunity. And then finally, Lord, open my mouth. If you can do that, some of the best witnessing that you could ever do and it's spelled out right here in three easy steps. 
Let's pray. Lord, a lot of times we try to make things confusing. A lot of times we, we want to show maybe how much we know when we're talking or witnessing to somebody. But Micah asks us, be humble, love mercy, love peace, love kindness. That's how we should witness. So Lord, if you would please, let us open a heart, open a door, and then open our mouth. Amen.